This is the west coast of the Outer Hebrides. Between us and America there is nothing but sea. Right here on this tangled rocky shore, the Atlantic finally stopped the trek of the early Celts north and west across Europe. Their final voyage took them across the Minch to the Western Isles, as we call them today, to the unpromising land of North Uist. They found a bleak country, pounded out of the oldest rock in the world by the force of the Atlantic and sand, which in its turn had made an uneasy marriage with peat to form a belt of barely arable land round the coast. In Gaelic, we call it Macher. Gradually, homesteads built up in clusters, their sites originally decided by conditions for living and defence. Invaders came hopefully and left disappointed. Even the Vikings who ravaged Uist left little mark. Of the three townships which fringe this most westerly promontory of North Uist, only Hoikery takes its name from the Norse. The other two, Tayari and Balranald, are Gallic. The old clan system was destroyed with Prince Charlie, and the Clan Ranald lands became huge sporting and sheep estates. The clansmen who weren't evicted overseas were allowed to squeeze livings out of the coastal patches and rough seas. Crofters, they're called now. They have clung on. Their traditions are being eroded by the media and mainland influence, but Gaelic is still the language of their family and church. This is a typical croft. By law, it is now secure to the crofter and his heirs. It's really a miniature farm, too small to provide a comfortable living, too tiny for mechanization. Communal effort has to make do for that, and without cooperation the crofting life would be totally impossible. Everybody helps everybody else, says Callum MacDonald. They're with me today and they'll be with somebody else tomorrow. Neil MacDonald of Hoigeri gives a helping hand to Donald John MacDonald of Balranald. The chances are that uh, given a gentle breeze and a dry day tomorrow, they'll be with Angus. As well as his croft, Angus runs the post office, quietly tailoring the one job to the other, perhaps, because in this kind of community it may sometimes be more urgent to thrash the corn than it is to stamp the mail. The post office may be run by the clock, but season and weather, dawn and dusk alone can govern the work of the croft. Communal effort ensures that the infirm are never forgotten and that the widow gets her share. North Uist houses are unsheltered against the Atlantic gales, for this is a bare and treeless land. Even the birds, like the starling and the skylark, have to improvise, or else they're bred to accept man's poles and posts as the trees and bushes that their kith and kin know elsewhere, as the young Uist man is bred to accept the croft as his future. Angus, the post office, knew from boyhood that one day he would have to make his living on the croft that was his father's. The crofts we have here, they're a bit small. I, I happen to be one of the 
more fortunate ones I, I work four crafts here, but they, they only amount to about 10 acres each. They're, the crafts are quite good for grazing, but they're not much use for cropping at all. We're quite dependent on the, on the, on the Macher land. It's from the Macher we take most of our crops. Their sheep and their cattle are the mainstays of the crofters' economy. Each family has a milk cow of tough but indeterminate breed. Crofters have neither the feeding nor the weather for dainty pedigrees, and when it comes to the annual calving, crofting wives like Jean MacDonald have to lend a soothing or at least a helping hand. There's a lot of benefits attached to having a cow, although sometimes, you know, it's you've got to milk her in the, at a certain time in the morning and the evening, and you've got to be there. Yeah, there's quite a lot of work attached to the to milk. A milking cow with a calf at foot used to be the dowry of a Hebridean bride, but uh, times are changing now, and it's much more likely that today's new arrival is regarded by Callum and Jean as a credit entry in the family budget when the cattle sales come round. The waves which burst on the U.S. shores have travelled miles in from the Atlantic, and their ground swell has uprooted the tangle and the seaweed from the bottom of the ocean to cast them finally on the beaches. 150 years ago, kelp, which was burnt to make chemicals for glass and soap, was a thriving industry in Uist. And when it collapsed, its loss caused one of the many waves of poverty that have swept this island. Nowadays, there's a thriving alginate industry in some parts of the Hebrides, with the product from the seaweed being used in the cosmetic and medical trades. But it hasn't been developed here, for which the turnstones and the sandalings are doubtless grateful for the torn weed carries with it a huge bonus of food for them. The sandalings are visitors on their way north to the Arctic to breed. The turnstones also are only passing through. The purple sandpiper winters here and soon follows the sandaling north. Like the birds, the Uist man accepts the sea's bounty and uses it in the way which nature surely intended. We do the sea weeding early in the year, January if possible. That depends on whether it's to be found on the shore at that time of year. It grows on the reefs quite a bit up from the shore and with the gales it gets torn off the reefs and blown onto the shore. Well, the seaweed is far better than artificial fertilizer, especially for the potato crop.
At first, the sand is loose and easily windblown, and nothing will grow in it except the springy maram grass, which is useless for cattle feed. But it has another use which is invaluable. As it grows, its roots intertwine tightly and it binds the sand and holds it firm. The seaward face of the sand dunes may be blown by westerly gales, but the Macher land is protected in the lee of the Maram belt. Over generations, the Uist men have practiced an elementary form of land reclamation by encouraging the Maram to hold the front. Without the Maram, the Macher would soon be a wind-blown desert, and any attempt at ploughing it would only make it easier for the wind to blow the top sand away. Bound by the Maram roots and fed with copious dressings of seaweed from the shore, the Macher can be encouraged to grow luxuriantly and even be strengthened sufficiently for the plough. In the winter and early spring, the Macher is bare and has little to offer in the way of food for beast or bird. But the Hooper's one has learnt a thing or two. It knows that this is the time against which the crofters made provision in the autumn and that it's essential for them to feed their cattle and their sheep through the lean, cold months. Recently, the swans have learnt that the Land Rover will appear regularly with loads of corn and uh, crofters like Angus John McClellan to dispense it. Once they come into us in October, they come to the Nahar, and when we start feeding the cattle, they start feeding along with the cattle. But it's unusual for uh, us to see this. It's just happened a couple of years back when these Hupas ones, that's when they started to come in to feed along with the cattle and feed on the fields or feed on the fallen grain. We get the geese earlier than the swans and we get uh, the ducks. But uh, they make quite a bit of mess on the corn right enough, but we're not worried about them. We fairly get a dish out of them now and again. We don't touch the swans. Some folks say that uh, the, it's a woman that had a curse put on you. Know, one of these uh, princess that had a curse and more or less that she's a woman than a bird. That's why we keep, everybody keeps away from her. The Kraftland surrounds what was once an arm of the sea, but it's now a huge stretch of marsh, Law and Gullar, the Gullar Marsh. It's probably a Viking name. There's nothing like it in the whole of the Western Isles for size. The older crofters remember when the shoveler was here as one of a much larger variety of duck, and he still mates here, but in fewer numbers now. The same applies to many birds, and it's probably because the character of the marsh is changing over the years and therefore the supply of the right food is diminishing or altering in quality. The birds are protected now and a warden supervises the area, but it may be a bit late for some birds already. The little grebe is not as plentiful as he used to be and the phalarope doesn't breed here anymore. Not so the red shank, who, along with all the rest, now enjoys the safety of Gular and can pursue his courtship unmolested. In 1966, the crofters of Hoikeri, Tayari and Balranald agreed to a nature reserve being set up by the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. They may have thought the idea a bit daft at first, but there was no obvious harm in it. To them, who had grown up among them, birds were just birds except for the ones that were good to eat. The red shank, or the peary as they call him, was not one of those.
Ducks, like the mallard, were a different matter. Today, however, on Gular, the mallard is allowed to multiply in peace, and the Peary seems set to follow his example. While the water birds have been in decline in North Uist, not because the crofters were eating them all, but because the marshes were being drained, birds like the lapwing continue to flourish unharmed and unmolested, relatively speaking. The lapwing, the buntings, the finches and the pied wagtail will thrive in Uist, so long as the crofter continues his traditional form of agriculture and is not seduced by the chemical catalogues. But there's a more fundamental threat to the future of the crofting tradition, and youngsters like Alistair MacDonald might have chosen a different way of life in different circumstances. I acquired the glebe from my father this year. It's quite a big area. It's over an hundred acres. I've got another two crofts. I didn't really want to be a crofter, but I started work just before I left school, so I didn't have much choice, really. You know. For his father, the measured tread of crofting life has been the beginning and end of ambition. And Alistair, for all his restlessness, senses a quality in his father's world. But sometimes I say to myself, wish I'd gone somewhere else, you know. Oh no, I don't think I can go anywhere else now because when I go to the mainland, especially the big cities, mm. I see the life there. <laughs> Where did I get home to the peace? There is a saying in this part of the world that when God made time, he made plenty of it. But the crofter's time was never taken up with bird watching, and yet he noted them in his songs, his proverbs, and his sayings. How hokarachishachurukek, they used to say, you're as tricky as a peewee. Obviously because of the peewit's habit of doing everything imaginable to trick an intruder away from her nest. As a boy, I remember the exasperation of it myself, till I learnt that uh, wherever the peewit was showing most excitement was where her chick was not. There is one bird who is firmly entrenched as part of island life, not least because of his unfailing art of making himself heard, the corn craig. One first becomes aware of him in the spring, during the ploughing and the sowing, when an occasional one makes himself heard, as rare as the cuckoo at first. Occasionally, one can catch a glimpse of one scuttering and scuttling here and there between the wild iris patches. As the summer comes in, they become impossible. They hawk and croak all evening like the rattlies at a football match, as long as there's a glisk of daylight. And here in Uist, the summer evenings are very long. Many a man they've driven out of his mind as he tried to sleep after a good day's work or a good night's dram.
the reclaiming of the moorland has had a fairly dramatic effect on the crofters' incomes. Now they're able to keep more cattle because they thrive on the lusher, regenerated land. Practically every crofter keeps a beast or two, which he feeds over the winter and sells at the spring sales. People like you, Donald John MacDonald, have developed a certain skill with stock. He always has a fair number of fat beasts at the sales and usually commands fat prices. The cattle are auctioned at Clachan, which is seven miles from Hoigiri. It's a long trek for those who can't take advantage of the van. Most of the beasts go to mainland buyers, who can fatten them further on better grazing than island crofters have, and then resell them at the huge sales in the lowlands. A good stirk can sell for 150 to 200 pounds. And even at that, prices are considerably lower than they are on the mainland, because the buyers have to allow for the heavy freight charges they have to pay to get the beasts across the minch. <laughs> A young heifer. Hey, Nigeria, you're shipping 60 pounds for a young heifer, 50. 40, and 41 bed, 41 bed, 41 bed, 41 bed, 41 bed, 40, 50, 50, 50, 50, 40, 60, 80, 50, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, Perhaps the planner's answer might be to weld many crofts into large farm units, all of which conjures up a picture of a prosperous youist of the future, populated by a few prosperous farmers, surrounded by myriads of protected birds. There are few sights more awesome than the lone golden eagle soaring in the loneliness of the Hebrides, her eye sharp enough to spot the movement of a baby rabbit a thousand feet below. The eagle is part of our Gallic legend and mythology. It's the subject of our songs and emblem of our heroes. But how much does the legend omit of the fact? Ewan MacDonald has shepherded the Uist hill since he was a boy, and like so many shepherds, he is convinced that the law protects a vicious, deadly killer of lambs. It's been a running argument for years, with the experts firmly entrenched in their view that the golden eagle may possibly take a dead lamb, but will never touch a living one. The shepherd naturally finds it hard to believe that the most powerful bird in the air is going to be kind and soft-hearted when it comes to a cuddly lamb. The trouble is that even Ewan only knows of someone who has seen an eagle take a living lamb. He hasn't got the proof of his own eyes. Meantime, he can only herd his flock in the knowledge that the eagle heroine of his Gallic folklore can watch every move of himself and his sheep and his lambs, secure not only in the height and isolation of her eyrie, but also safe behind the majesty of the law.
The eaglet spends 12 weeks in the nest before taking to the air. During that time, the diet provided for her has ranged from rabbits to rats or any other carrion for that matter. The simple fact is that the golden eagle, for all her advantages of beauty and legend, is as much a scavenger as the hoodie crow or the black-backed gull. There are few lovelier sights than the macker in summer, when it's matted with flowers, daisies, buttercups, pansies and hundreds more. These are the fallow parts, used for grazing the cattle during the short summer nights and long days. Small shorebirds, like the dunlin, often nest in the hoof marks left by the cows. But when the eggs hatch, the parents are in a frenzy trying to herd the chicks away from the trampling hooves of the beasts. They have plenty of time, for there are few things in life more leisurely than a grazing newest cow. A summer day on the Macher is one of the many things that the islander, forced to live in the city, remembers and hopes to come back to. Many of them never do, till they're carried back at the end. Many islanders take out special insurance policies to guarantee that they're laid to rest in the soil of their homeland when the time comes. In the Hebrides, the kirkyards are usually in sight of the sea. The old men used to say that the autumn came with the grey lag and not with the calendar, and that uh, thousands of miles away the geese could tell exactly when the corn would be ripe in Uist. The wheat deer is of another mind. He is only here in the passing. Winter in Uist is not for him, and he prepares to set off in chase of the sun on other Macherlands. The harvest begins here much later than on the mainland, and indeed often enough the crofters are still garnering the stooks of corn in late October. Their growing plots are not all in the one place, and sometimes they have to wait several days for a neighbour to cut his first swathe before they can make a start. These delays can cause a bit of bad feeling, particularly if people get the impression that they're losing days of good drying weather because of someone else's tardiness. Fine days and good drying winds are priceless gifts in autumn. Which way the corn is cut depends on the way the wind has been blowing and how it has made the corn lie. The crofter's machines are designed to cut in one direction only and they can operate only when the stems of the corn lie properly for the cutter. The harvest is a fat time for the birds and they make the most of it. It's an urgent and busy time for the crofters. 
A really bad harvest can be disaster anywhere, but doubly so on Uist. Failure means that the winter feed has to be imported from the mainland. And that is why, on a day like this, Alistair is glad of the extra help from his young brother, Donald. I left school in June this year. I am 16 years old. I have worked with my brother since I left school, helping him with the cattle and the corn and all the other craft work. I would have liked to come to a college or some place to learn a trade of some kind. I have not found a job and I have to stay here. The ordinary potato is the most cherished produce of the croft, probably because in a race of long memories, the dreadful days of the potato famine have left a lingering ghostly shadow. Angus Boyd still uses the traditional krochgan, the hook which is still regarded as the most thorough and effective instrument for all its simplicity. With it, the potato lifting is fine and accurate, and not an eye is left in the ground. It can be a lonely, back-breaking job. But the potato harvesting is the last and most important chore of autumn. However, it's one for which the whole family can turn out. Even the school children are given a holiday to help, and they're probably the only ones who are sorry to see the last spud lifted. Tayari school must now serve Hoigiri and Balranald as well, and even at that, the school population is only 17. It would be very good if the young people, after leaving school, if they could have jobs here. Some of them have a longing to come back, but others, once they get a taste of the mainland, they want to stay away. But it would be fine to see more young people coming back to work and to carry on the work of their parents. There are only 155 people left in this beautiful but thankless land, and it's easier to dwell on the past than see into the future. The crofting population can't increase because the land can't support any more. The young men can't leave for employment elsewhere because employment isn't there. The nightmare is already with them. Life is hard here, sometimes cruel in the winter. 
But the Uist man has survived famine before now. He has survived the most cruel eviction policy this country has ever known. At least today his home is secure to him. And fortune can change tomorrow. Ich bin da, das doch hell um. Ich bin da, das doch hell um. 